So my name is Maribel. I'm a neuroscience graduate student in the Cowley Lab. And today I will go over um, some of the research I've been doing for my PhD. Um, but before I start the science portion, I'll give a little bit of background on my experience in STEM as a minority student and also talk a bit about some outstanding diversity programs that were instrumental in my academic career. Um, so to start off, um, my parents immigrated to the United States from a small village in Guerrero, Mexico called Cerro Alto, um, and they moved here to seek better job opportunities. Um, but because they had less than a sixth grade education, when they moved here, they found work mainly picking fruit and vegetables throughout California. So for those not super familiar with what that job entails, being kind of like Cesar Chavez and the farm workers labor movement. Um, and because this was their sole income source, they were required to move frequently like based on seasonal harvest. And as a daughter of migrant farm workers, this meant that I was moving a lot, including like back and forth between the US and Mexico up until I entered um, first grade. Um, eventually, we did settle in Lamont, California, which is a small community in the Central Valley. Um, and then here, my parents still worked as farm workers, and eventually so did my siblings and I to help my parents financially. Um, but what I think it's important to highlight, um, to kind of give context to the next few slides, is that because this was a farm worker community, um, we did not have access to the best education, and all the schools in the area are actually considered Title I um, schools. Um, so then how does someone that is a first generation student and that comes from a community with few educational resources succeed at a place like UC Berkeley? Okay, so I'm just kind of gonna list the programs. Um, so there was a ton of programs at UC Berkeley that like really helped me out either by like kind of offering tutoring, which was free or kind of being a place of community for minority students. Um, they had a ton of research programs for minority students. And then like, I think the most important one for me was the UCSF undergraduate research inter internship program because that one was specifically for minority students that um, didn't have any prior research experience, which I think I really needed because I kept getting rejected because they were like, well, why haven't you done research? And I was like, because no one gives me a chance. Um, and so one of the takeaway messages kind of that I have for this audience is that there are many opportunities for minority students to get involved in STEM. Um, but often the students that are the target audience are the same students that are the least likely to have the resources and knowledge about applying to them or even that they exist. So here I kind of just want to list some large programs that provide support and funding to URM students, such as like IMSD, Mark, McNair, NIH Diversity Supplements. I really want to highlight the NIH Diversity Fund and will directly fund a student like across all levels, including like high school, undergrad, and grad students. Um, these are also some research conferences that are specific for minority students, and a lot of them off offer um, travel awards. And so my hope is that by advertising these type of programs, faculty, grad student mentors, et cetera, will be able to encourage minority students to apply. And this may seem like a very small thing, but to minority students, this can make a world of a difference. So for example, the programs I mentioned, I actually didn't apply to them until very late because I didn't think I was qualified. But then my grad student mentor encouraged me to apply and then that somehow gave me a ton of confidence and then I was awarded a bunch of stuff after that. Um, so I will pause here kind of to talk about my research for a little bit. Um, so, if, But then I'll come back to it at the end. So if you remember the title of my talk, um, I'll be talking about the development of a new circuit tracing tool to study cortical connectivity at transcriptomic resolution. Um, so for a bit of background, let's talk about the mammalian cerebral cortex. So the cortex is made up of neurons and non-neuronal cells that are organized into distinct anatomical or functional regions that together give rise to many higher order brain functions such as language, cognition, attention, sensory perception, motor planning, and many other things. Um, so the cortex has six layers and it is composed of mixtures of excitatory neurons, inhibitory interneurons, and non-neuronal cells such as astrocytes and microglia. Um, and all of these different cell types talk to one another through highly complex circuits that ultimately give rise to higher cognitive processing. So to understand cortical processing, it's necessary to gain insight not only about the different cell types that make up the cortex, but also the precise ways that they are connected to one another. Um, 
So one of the earliest attempts to kind of classify cell types is based on their morphological appearance. And throughout the past decades, the introduction of new molecular markers and electrophysiological methods has allowed for much finer and more detailed classifications. Um, so why is it important to characterize and describe different cell types accurately? Well, there's a lot of evidence that different cell types have distinct connectivity patterns. So for example, studies have shown that VIP inhibitory neurons are primarily connected to and inhibit um, somatostatin neurons, whereas PV cells are mostly connected to pyramidal neurons or other parvalbumin neurons. So understanding the connectivity pattern of cell types is important because studies have shown that distinct types and microcircuits play distinct roles in function. So kind of sticking to the example of inhibitory neurons, um, PV inhibitory neurons have been implicated in gain control, somatostatin and the suppression of lateral and feedback interactions, and then VIP in the regulation of somatostatin cells. Um, so clearly understanding the connectivity patterns of neurons is important to understand function. So to this end, a method often employed to study connectivity of neurons is monosynaptic rabies tracing. And rabies tracing has been widely used um, for circuit tracing throughout both the central and peripheral nervous system. And this method involves removing the rabies virus glycoprotein, which is an envelope protein necessary for viral budding and transynaptic spread from the genome. And then of note, G-deleted rabies virus can be pseudotyped with the avian sarc sarcoma leukosis virus glycoprotein and VEI, which requires avian TBA receptor for entry. Um, and because mammalian neurons do not express TBA, only cells um, engineered to express TBA can be infected by pseudotype G-deleted rabies. Um, so this method can be used to investigate the cortical connectivity of cell types by labeling the presynaptic inputs to a cell type of interest that usually expresses pre recombinase in a mouse line. So typically, Cre-dependent AAV helper viruses are used to supply the, gly the glycoprotein and the TBA protein to the cell type of interest. Then pseudotype rabies virus is injected, resulting in the selective infection of the TBA expressing cells. Um, and then because these cells also express rabies glycoprotein, rabies virus can then spread um, transsynaptically from the starter cell to the input cell. Um, and then importantly, because the input cell does not express rabies glycoprotein, the spread is monosynaptically restricted. Um, so in summary, this method allows the inputs to the starter cells of interest to be labeled typically with a fluorescent reporter. Um, however, limitations um, to using rabies tracing to study connectivity exist, the first one being that for the most part, rabies tracing studies fail to characterize the cell type identity of the majority of inputs, limiting analysis to regional distribution of input. So for example, in this case, if you inject rabies in the left motor cortex, using rabies tracing, you can see where the inputs are coming from, such as the contralateral motor cortex. Um, however, with rabies tracing alone, um, you won't establish the identity of the input cell. Um, and so essentially, you'll know where the cells are, but you won't always know what the cells are. Um, and of course, some studies have tried to establish the identity of rabies-labeled input cells with things like antibody staining or intersectional approaches using genetically modified mouse lines. Um, but because these approaches have their own, um, but both of these approaches have their own limitations, such as relying on the existence of antibodies um, or creating a bunch of mouse lines, um, which can be very time consuming. Um, so the second limitation of rabies tracing is not inherent to rabies tracing itself, but rather to our current understanding of cortical neuronal diversity. So we are starting to learn that cortical cell types have greater diversity that can be captured by broad cell classes defined by major molecular markers. So for example, keep in mind that historically somatostatin neurons have been thought to be like one single neuronal cell class. However, a study investigating somatostatin neurons in motor cortex found that these inner neurons in different cortical layers have distinct firing properties, distinct morphology, and specialized innervation patterns. So these studies demonstrate the importance of separating like major cell classes into distinct cell types. Um, because here we have a concrete example of what was considered like one class, somatostatin, um, doing very different things. And then current advances in single cell transcriptomics have begun to offer a new paradigm for classification that allows for finer separation of major neuron classes. So for example, using single cell RNA sequencing, one study described more than 100 distinct transcriptomic cell types. Um, and then it was revealed that each of the parvalbumin 
um, the AP somatostatin class um, groups are actually composed probably of like 10 to 20 distinct cell types um, based on their gen genomic expression profiles. So what my project seeks to accomplish is to develop a way to reveal connectivity of neurons at the level of subtypes defined by their gene expression. So for example, we may want to know the transcriptomic identity of an input neuron making direct monosynaptic connections to a population of interest. So to accomplish this, we would combine pre-dependent rabies tracing with fluorescence activated nuclei sorting and um, single nuclei RNA sequencing. And then if successful, this tool would allow to reveal the transcriptomic profile of input neurons to populations of interest. Um, but to move forward with our proposed plan, we needed to address a very large caveat, and that was that we needed to answer the question, can rabies-infected neurons be classified according to established transcriptomic cortical cell types? And this was because we didn't know to what extent rabies infection would affect gene expression and whether this would hinder the transcriptomic characterization of cell. So to use single cell sequencing kind of for the proposed method, it was necessary to first conduct transcriptomic analysis of very large numbers of rabies-infected cortical neurons. Um, so to accomplish this, I did two different approaches. One was to infect large numbers of cortical neurons with rabies virus in an unbiased manner using unsuited type rabies. The other approach was to select for inhibitory neurons specifically by restricting rabies infection to GATU positive cells. Um, and then after infection, tissues dissected out, nuclei preps um, are made from the dissected regions, um, and then rabies positive nuclei are collected using back sorting, and then these nuclei undergo single nuclei RNA sequencing. Um, in total, we collected about 9,000 rabies infected nuclei, and this one com was compared to a control data set of about 9,000 uninfected nuclei. And we initially conducted cluster analysis of rabies infected and uninfected nuclei without integration, and we found that um, nuclei cluster primarily by their infection status, with rabies nuclei in red having a clear separation from uninfected controls in blue. So kind of observing this clear separation prompted us to examine the global response to rabies infection and identify possible transcriptomic differences between rabies infected and uninfected nuclei. So we performed differential expression analysis and found more than 500 differentially expressed genes between rabies and control nuclei. Um, and then to assess the functional enrichment of genes upregulated and downregulated, um, we performed gene set enrichment analysis and we found um, genes were associated with like things like viral response pathways, such as type one interferon, cytokine production, et cetera. Um, and then however, what we were most interested in was whether despite these changes, rabies nuclei could still be transcriptomically um, classified. So to do this, um, we used the computational strategies for integrated analysis of single nuclei sequencing data sets that have been shown to enable comparisons of heterogeneous tissues across different experimental conditions. And using this method, contrary to our initial findings, with integration, um, nuclei now cluster according to biological cell types instead of by infection status. Um, and we use differential expression gene, differentially expressed genes and previously reported cell type markers to annotate the clusters into subclasses. And we were able to find um, and identify the major inhibitory subclasses such as SOM, PBVIP, um, and also the excitatory subclasses. And then we further explored rabies cell type specific changes and we found upregulated and downregulated genes in all clusters and classes with non-neuronal cells displaying the greatest change in transcriptomic profiles. Um, and we found that genes upregulated across all clusters are those involved in things like antiviral and immune responses. Um, although many genes were part of a global response across clusters, other genes were differentially expressed only in specific clusters or classes. So for example, um, here, NOT1 is only upregulated in oligodendrocytes. And then we next focused on analysis on examining rabies effects on genes commonly used to define neuronal cell types. So in the next couple of slides, I'll show examples of differential effects of infection on neuronal marker genes. And for visualization purposes, I selected some marker genes that are affected and some that are um, unperturbed. And these are by no means a comprehensive list of all important markers. Um, but for example, here I'm showing that while GAT1 and GAT2 are, unaffect are unaffected by infection, um, this gene, which is also a marker of inhibitory neurons, is significantly downregulated um, across all inhibitory clusters in the rabies-infected nuclei. 
Um, and this slide displays many genes, some unperturbed, some that are affected. But the main takeaway is that some marker genes that are used for identifying subclasses of inhibitory neurons are downregulated after infection, such as somatostatin, um, parvalbumin, and BIP. Um, and we saw similar patterns um, for excitatory marker genes. Again, the main point to take away here is that every cluster has some genes that are affected by rabies and some that are not affected. Um, so in summary, we found that rabies infection induces global and cell type specific transcriptional changes in infected neuronal and non-neuronal nuclei. Um, rabies can downregulate or upregulate neuronal marker genes, um, but despite these changes in gene expression with integration, um, rabies infected nuclei can still be transcriptomically um, classified. Um, so I just super quickly want to go through some of this. Um, so kind of going back to the DEI programs, um, I want to highlight a program that I co-founded in 2016 with other neuro and COXI grad students. So when we were all first years, we kind of noticed that our respective grad programs lacked representation of ethnic minorities. And kind of instead of waiting for the program or university to do something about it, we decided to start an organization called Colors of the Brain. And what we seek is to increase the representation of minority students interested in brain sciences like neuroscience, COXI, psychology, um, in PhD or MD PhD programs. And so to try to achieve this, we started offering mentorship to UCSD undergrads. So we organized workshops like how to apply to a research position, how to apply to grad school, et cetera. Um, oops. Um, uh, and, and kind of when we started, we, it, it didn't go great the first year. We didn't have a ton of students coming to our event, but I did want to kind of mention that because I want to talk about the importance of kind of sticking with something that you start or if you're interested in diversity efforts, kind of being aware that it can be a lot of work and that you won't always see the results immediately. But even if you're only helping like a, a few students, like it makes a world of a difference to them. Um, and then finally, I did want to talk about that we stuck with it long enough that last year um, with the financial help of the Kavli Institute for Brain and Mind, we were able to launch our own summer funded research program called the Colors of the Brain KIBM Scholars Program. And each scholar is awarded a 5,000 um, stipend to conduct research full time at Salk or UCSD for 10 weeks. Um, but what makes our program different from any other research programs is that we emphasize both mentorship in addition to research excellence. So for example, each scholar gets placed in a mentorship pod with three to five graduate students, um, and the students help them throughout their very first summer research experience. Um, and then we also restrict lab placement options to those that grad student mentors have defined as having excellent mentorship environments. And what this means is that we physically create a list of uh, potential faculty mentors, reach out to them and ask them if they will be willing to take on a student. And then we have a mentorship contract agreement that they adhere to if they do take on a student. Um, and lastly, I want to announce that the program has been renewed and will be expanded for next summer. We will be accepting um, five to six scholars um, and the application will be open in January. And here's our website. Um, so that's it.